gonna die out here. Hold it, we'll wait on that. Look at you, you look great. Am I gonna vomit all day long? There's a good possibility of that. Time to save the planet. If you're a person that loves the wild outdoors, a horizon that never quits, the salty sea air and the eternal sunshine, then you're in the right place, my friend. My name is Dominic Bonicelli, and I will admit to you, I am addicted to adventure. So I'm on a road trip between Miami and Key West. I'm looking for every high octane adventure I can on the way, but I'm not just here to have fun. I'm also getting dirty in the trenches with local unsung heroes who pitch in every single day to make this place as spectacular as it is. I begin my journey in the backyard of the fourth largest urban area in America, Greater Miami. But not three miles from downtown sits a tropical paradise called Key Biscayne. And this is where I plan to tackle a sport that tends to be a little rough on beginners. But I figure I mastered half of it years ago, the kite. There's no better place to reacquaint myself with the kite than on the ocean side of Key Biscayne at Miami Kiteboarding, which sits on the beach in the heavenly and tropical Crandon Park. So what is kiteboarding? It's a mix of a flying a kite and using the wind to pull us on a wetboard. So it's a very simple concept, but it's very exhilarating and a challenge. So I'm here to find out exactly what is the allure of this sport that is quickly becoming an addiction to so many across the globe. Anytime it's windy, I want to be riding, jumping up in the air and flying. And these shallow warm waters are the perfect place for me to attempt to earn my wings in this fast growing and high flying sport. To kite board, you need a board, a kite, and a bar. Not like a margarita bar. Uh, no, no. I challenged my instructor, Ayub, to build me up from Paduan to master in a matter of hours. It's an inflatable kite. Our first kite was a trainer kite that would help me to get the basic feel. You know what it looks like is a stealth bomber, but it like sort of a metrosexual stealth bomber. As you walk and you want to keep these on between your legs. <laughs> this is really similar to the um, amateur puppetry I do in Europe in the summers to make money. <laughs> Perfect, and you just keep walking with it. And once we had the kite all prepped for flight, Ayub went over a complex set of instructions. And more you go upwind, the kite's gonna change angles. You understand? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> but Ayub assured me that understanding would come in due time. So we raised the stealth wing into the air. Now right, right, push the bar forward. And back to the ground. Uh -oh. Left, 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 left. And again. Push the bar forward. And again. Oh, now it's twisted all to <laughs> Lean backwards. Perfect. Right, 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 right. Push the bar. And after I got mildly comfortable with controlling the kite, <laughs> we changed it out for a bigger one and headed into the water for some more practice. I can't say that I was quickly becoming a master at kiting, but never has near drowning been so much fun. Unfortunately, the gods had had enough of my pathetic flailing and tried their hardest to save me from myself with a sickening trick. Fortunately, Chris and Ayub had another kite and I was ready to go all in. Now you pull the bar in, we dive your kite to the right. Shoulder, sure stand up, stand up, stand up. Make sure that you have tension on your harness, not on your arms. The kite is like a girl, you have just to feel it and just be gentle with it. <laughs> you know, if not, it's never gonna work. <laughs> left side, hold the left, hold the left. When you stand up, stay up. So if you're looking for guest instructors for the summer, I probably got a couple weeks for you if you need some help. Hold the ball. Power, power. Perfect. I'm not going to pretend that I became a guru of kiteboarding today, but I did manage to get up and ride the wind, if only for a short while. And it was enough to make me understand just why kiteboarding is making a huge splash in the world of water sports. So I said goodbye to Ayub and headed out of town to where the metropolis of Miami butts up to one of the wildest natural lands the country has to offer. The Everglades is where I'm heading, 
but first I will make a quick stop at a little outpost right at the swamp's front door, where I'll meet a man who knows much about the dangerous animals that lurk in the watery wilderness. Do they keep you in the cage all day long? No, they let me out for dinner. <laughs> hey, I'm Dominic. Hey, Dominic, pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. This place is insane. It's like a rift yeah. in the space-time continuum. Is that a Florida panther in the same cage as a dog? Yes, yep, we raise them together so they can rough house and play and get their exercise together. Bob Freer is the owner of the Everglades Outpost, an animal rescue center that not only rehabilitates and releases injured wild animals, but also gives a home to exotic pets that were abandoned by their owners or confiscated by authorities. These animals also serve to educate visitors and local school groups on conservation. What's the cat's name, Mom? Sable. Is her whole body hanging off my yeah. pants right now? Yep. What could possibly go wrong? Sable serves here as an ambassador for a species that is very slowly making a comeback from the very edge of extinction. Oh, God. In the 70s, there may have been as few as just a couple dozen Florida panthers living in the wild. Watch Pains. your fingertips. Although their numbers have increased, they are still extremely endangered and can only be found in the wilderness at the southern tip of the state. Oh, God. <laughs> But this big cat isn't the only formidable animal dwelling in the Everglades. This is my snake room. What's the most venomous snake you have out here in the glades? The most toxic venom is going to be your coral snake. If you got bit by one this size, would it be dangerous? Yes, yeah, it'd be deadly. And you're just handing it so cavalier with your fingers. Well, once it gets used to being handled and finds out that you're not gonna harm it, right. then normally it's not gonna bite you. These are the ones that are causing all the problem in the Everglades. Oh. Burmese pythons are an invasive species here in South Florida. They're eating rabbits, rats, raccoons. They found a 70 pound deer in one stomach. The alligators, bobcats. Bob also acquired a cobra that was found nearby in Homestead. Some evidence suggests that even cobras may have a small breeding population here in the glades, likely from unlicensed pets being released into the wilderness. He shouldn't actually turn around and try to bite. If he does, he's slow moving, bring the arm down, and that throws his head away from my hand. But the likelihood of happening upon a cobra in the Everglades is slim to none. Not the case with the good old American alligator. Florida is second only to Louisiana in the number of alligators living in the wild. And in Florida, the Everglades is ground zero. So Bob sees his share of alligators that have made their way into the backyards and canals in the Miami metro area. Some of those gators end up here at the outpost where Bob uses them for teaching. And in fact, today he needs to catch an alligator for an educational exhibition this afternoon at a nearby school. We'll catch one up for you and have it ready for you in just a uh, few minutes. So before getting back on the road, I gave Bob a hand. Okay, this is my grow out pen. The alligators here are from about six foot down to four foot. So we're gonna go ahead and pick the largest one we see. That when I say we, I actually mean you. Could he break my knee with his tail thrash? No, highly overrated. My knees are highly underrated though. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, now we just take the towel and we wet it a little bit. Okay. <laughs> now right. it's like he's getting a, a massage at the yeah. spot. <laughs> okay, it's bring this down and step on it with your left foot. Oh, okay. Now go ahead and kneel over him and put both hands right on the neck. Put your weight right on his body. Bob secured his jaws and then covered the gator's eyes. Covering your eyes will cause him to actually relax and less stressful ah. for them in the move. Pick them up and right close to your body. Oh, you got an alligator behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the heads up there, Bob. But getting a secure hold on this one was a little scratchier than I expected. <laughs> this is like carrying the angriest piece of luggage I've ever had in my life. Now you got head and tail. In the end, I think I did a smash up job as an alligator handler. Just set them gingerly right there which I think more than qualifies me to tackle the Everglades in the morning. Pleasure meeting you. I appreciate it. Watch your fingers. I will. Take care. When the sun dawns, it's me versus the Everglades when I go waist deep and one-on-one -on -one with the untamed wetlands. I've heard that there are 20-foot pythons floating around out here. Then I'll continue south in my search for the perfect eco-adventure. Time to save the planet.
I'm Dominic Bonicelli, and I'm on a road trip between Miami and Key West. Stand up, stand up. While hunting down insane outdoor adventures. Nice job. And also rolling up my sleeves to help local wildlife experts with some extreme field work. Hold it, put weight on that. Today, I hope to discover the magic of the South Florida wetlands without getting eaten by them. The Everglades are rife with boardwalks and bicycle trails and pedestrian walkways, but that's a little bit too tame. I would rather be buried in the muck and the slime. I think that is the proper way to earn this kind of insane landscape. What's happening? Hey, you look like Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> What's going on, Alex? Dominic. Nice to meet you. Is this the place? It looks yeah, like we're in the middle of nowhere. This is where we're going. So I get a pilgrim stick? Yeah, man, that's you. Jackpot, man, let's Ready do it. You get what? Into the muck. I noticed that you're walking without even shoes on. Are you part hobbit? <laughs> I don't know, the, the way I feel about it, walking your bare feet, and you feel the cypress needles, and you feel the roots. Sometimes you feel a sharp rock, but that's just part of the deal. And the way I look at it, if you were to step on a snake, I'd be able to feel the snake before I'd really get bit. I could jump off of it real quick. If I were wearing shoes, I wouldn't feel it. You know, I'd just step on and then there goes the but ankle. What if you stepped right on its mouth, like, to uh, start with? That'd be no bueno. So what are the uh, slimy, ferocious predators I should be watching out for? Oh, you know, back here we've got your alligators, you've got eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, you've got water moccasins, aka cottonmouths, you've got pygmy rattlesnakes, You've got coral snakes, pythons, Florida panthers, black bear. Yeah, this is no place for children. <laughs> Unsupervised. <laughs> Big spider web right there. <laughs> this place is covered with spiders, man. The spiders aren't protected, right? I can just mess up uh, there. Everything habitat. in the national park is protected. Okay. So I'm gonna respect the spider's habitat for once in my life. Good man. So what is the Everglades? What, what does that even mean? Everglades, it translates into river of grass. And as that water is flowing through the Everglades, it's being filtered out by the sawgrass, by the cattails, all of your aquatic vegetation. That's why it's so crystal clear. That is surprising, because I thought it would be all mucky. I, know, I thought right? it would be a mud fest. That's one of my favorite things, is bringing people back here that were expecting to see this dark, nasty, swampy water. And they're like, oh my god, it's crystal clear. You can see everything inside of it. Is that seaweed? It looks like seaweed. It's called bladderwort. It sounds like an infection. <laughs> it does. It's actually the world's most advanced carnivorous plant. So if you hold it for too long, you're gonna come away with just bony nubs. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. But it is carnivorous. So this is like the Venus flytrap of the swamp. In a way, for your aquatic microorganisms and maybe even up to mosquito larva. Did you hear that? Yeah, it sounded like an alligator splash. It sounded like from over there. Whoa. Yeah, it gets really nice and deep here. Which is relaxing, because I've heard that there are 20-foot pythons floating around out here. Oh, yeah. So are those bubbles I see coming up from alligators beneath you? That's the uh, decomposition going on between the cypress needles, all the decaying ferns, all the decay is producing the methane. I feel like I'm in a witch's cauldron. A witch's brew. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a sharp stick. I'll sell you my shoes for $150. Oh, you drive a hard bargain, sir. In our quest for the alligator, we stumbled upon a small snake curled up in a fern. What kind of snake is it? It's a brown water snake. They're not venomous. His eyes were a little glazed over because he was molting. So after checking him out, we moved on and let him shed his skin in peace. We get to see a pretty cool, very rare orchid here in a second. Are there orchid thieves? Yes, and that's why it's so rare. People actually come into the Everglades and illegally collect orchids. This is your cow horn orchid, AKA cigar orchid. It's hideous, I find it repellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's really not much to it right now. They're pretty flowers, they really are, but you guys missed it by just about a week or so. This is the area where the splash came from. They're really not out to get you, but there have been instances throughout Florida where alligators have attacked and killed people. So yeah, well you don't want to disturb them too much. Aha, we've got a female right here. You can just see it through these cypress trees. There are typically two or three alligators that hang around here. One of them is about 10, 11 feet long, and the other one is this one. That's the small one. That's the small one. That looks Doesn't like a look huge so small. Long. <laughs> Males will grow into the day they die. Females generally stop growing at about nine or 10 feet long. Tickle, tickle, tickle. Look, I'm putting her to sleep. You will do my bidding. Oh, yes. Oh. 
In the end, this enchanting fairyland far exceeded my expectations. But my next destination was beckoning. So we slowly made our way back to the road where I said goodbye to Alex. Thank you so much, dude. Absolutely. Can I keep the stick? Sure. My pleasure, man. Now I must continue my trek toward Key West in search of the most amazing outdoor adventures. Hold it! Go wait on it! My name is Dominic Bonicelli, and I am on a road trip from Miami to Key West, hunting down off-the-beaten-path adventures, but also finding local heroes who work every day to protect this beautiful landscape. Look at you. You look great. This morning, I'm heading south into the always lush and tropical Florida Keys. Key Largo is spectacular. It's actually inspiring me to get outside a little bit and do some gardening. But unlike most gardens, this garden doesn't need any extra water. I have to hurry up, though, because I'm late as always, and the very survival of the oceans is at stake. Glad you could make it. Time to save the coral. <laughs> Corals are animals. Yeah, this is not your everyday biology 101, but more of an eco-hero training camp. Say Zoe Zanthelli. Zoe Zanthelli. Very good. And today, we become coral experts. The corals cannot survive without the Zoe Zanthelli. We learn what makes it thrive and what is causing the steady and drastic decline of coral reefs throughout the world. Degraded water quality. Way too many nutrients in the water. Too cold or too warm. And most importantly, we're learning a technique that can be used to grow corals in nurseries and then transplant them onto the reef. We are going to be using underwater epoxy. It's a two-part epoxy. You mix it under the water. It's kind of like gluing these coral fragments onto the reef itself, OK? Does everyone understand what we're going to be doing out there? Yeah. Who's ready to dive? Yeah. Woo! Yeah! Our day has been planned out by an organization called EcoKeys. We created EcoKeys to offer tourists here in the Florida Keys the opportunity to not only go out and snorkel, dive, kayak, see the Everglades, sail, but also learn about the habitat that they're seeing. And in most of the activities, we give our customers an opportunity to do something for the habitat that they're seeing and they're enjoying. 35? Helping to grow and transplant coral is only one of the many activities that's available through EcoKeys. But to offer this particular adventure, they teamed up with a group called the Coral Restoration Foundation. And its founder, Ken Niedermeyer, rendezvoused with us at the site of one of the organization's coral nurseries. What is the Coral Restoration Foundation? We're about teaching people how to grow corals and restore coral reefs. And so I want people to realize that, that there is hope and that there's something that can be done. And we were about to be a part of that process. Time to save the planet. The Coral Nursery is an otherworldly collection of differing types of coral grown in different ways. The bizarre landscape is a product of experimentation on the most efficient way to grow healthy coral. We kept improving and improving. When we started growing them on those trees, it just was so effective. Ken found that coral grown in this fashion could grow up to three times faster than the other methods, which is part of the reason he needs us here today. The nursery is growing exponentially. I mean, we can't keep up with how much coral is out there. So we took trimmings from the hanging coral and labeled each one according to its specific genome so that the foundation can keep records on which genotypes are performing better in which conditions. We found disease-resistant corals, heat-resistant corals, cold-resistant corals. They're even doing some genetic experimentation. Our goal is to start crossing these corals, try to get this coral for the 21st century. That's the goal. <laughs> So, doing our part for the reef and for science, we brought up bundles of coral from the sea floor. Now we're off to the second dive site. We'll take the coral that we just harvested and replant it. So we boated to a nearby reef, hopped in, and descended to the bottom in search of the perfect home for our newly clipped coral. And as we skirted the reef, we were immediately met with a thousand reasons why saving coral is so imperative. The diversity of a coral reef is like an underwater rainforest. There are thousands and thousands of different species. 
The fish need a place to live, and all the critters that live there, they're important. The fisheries collapse if coral reefs collapse. A lot of the coastal islands, you know, the barrier reef offshore is what protects the islands. That's why they can live on the island. So to help in our own small way to protect this fragile ecosystem, we chiseled the algae away from the limestone and used epoxy to cement each new coral growth to the reef in three places. It's slow progress and seemingly futile to undo the damage being done to these reefs every single year. But for those who work here day in and day out, there is a glimmer of hope. I like to say we're buying time, we're providing hope and we're buying time. You know, time for us all to get our act together and stop flushing the earth down the toilet. I will say, I just read a recent report from the sanctuary. They just released this in over 20 years. This was the first year that they actually saw an increase in coral cover at some of the reefs here in the Keys. So the increase that you saw this year, is that in any part due to organizations like Eco Keys making a difference? There's no way to know for sure, of course, but I'd like to think so. If nothing else, education goes a long way. If you can teach people that come down here and enjoy why this habitat is important, I feel like that's making almost as much of a difference as going out and actually planting the coral out there. So with the feeling that perhaps I've made a real difference, if even small, I headed back to the surface and back to the marina, where I got on the road heading further south than my search for the perfect eco-adventure. Tomorrow, I will lend a hand to another sea creature who hopefully, when I'm done, gives me my hand back. My name is Dominic Bonicelli, and I am blazing a trail down the overseas highway through the Florida Keys in pursuit of adrenaline-laced outdoor adventures. Today, I head to Isla Mirada as part of a University of Miami research expedition that pits high school and university students against one of the greatest predators in the oceans. And I will admit, it is totally my fear animal. But if you're gonna save the planet, you have to man up. Hey, hey, hey I'm Dominic. Hey, Actually, I wanna wait to shake your hand. <laughs> So after boarding the research vessel RV Ensley, we headed out to sea in hopes of catching a handful of sharks, tagging them and collecting data that can be used to further understand the habits of sharks and the health of shark populations. But today, the ones collecting the data are not your usual suspects. I'm Doug, my favorite shark is the bull shark. My name's Jamie and my favorite shark is the thresher shark. I'm Mackenzie and my favorite is the nurse shark. <laughs> what is your favorite kind of shark, did you say? Oh, an epaulette shark. You know, it's like polka dotty. Oh, that sounds so sassy. Today, this boat has become a classroom for a local high school marine science program in their study of sharks. And their teacher for the day, Catherine McDonald, a graduate student from the University of Miami. Uh, a shark that was starving to death would starve to death faster eating me than it would eating nothing at all. Because they have to digest all of this very thick mammalian calcified bone. This class is put on by the RJ Dunlap Marine Conservation Program at the University of Miami. And the experts aboard this vessel are mostly students and interns at UM. The purpose of the program is to immerse high school students in the world of marine biology in hopes of creating an army of stewards of the seas. We take out about 1,400 kids a year. There's a lot of people walking around South Florida who've been out on a shark tagging trip with us. These students are from Coral Shores High School in Tavernier, Florida. Bull, got a decent shot at, great hammer. Yeah, it could happen. Um, those of you who are out for the mega mouth and the great white, I'm sorry, I think you're gonna be out of luck today. <laughs> but no matter what species the students haul in today, they'll be getting hands-on experience face-to-face -face with the top predator of the sea. And the first step will be casting the baited lines. We toss them into the water, let the 900-pound monofilament unspool, and then sink the bait to the bottom with a drum weight. Another rope will run to the surface, where several buoys mark its location in the water. Today we'll be running a total of 30 lines, and hoping to catch as many as 7 to 10 sharks. So once the baited lines were all in place, we needed to hang out nearby and watch for movement in the buoys. What better way to pass the time, really, while drawing in massive predators than to go for a dip? The 
place is called Chamonix. <laughs> you were swimming out there for 10 minutes. You're not worried about a great white coming up? And... No, it's one in four million chance of getting eaten by a shark. Is that the actual number? So you I make think, that up. No, that's the actual number. Doesn't phase you I'm pretty at all. safe. Jeez, do you take Taekwondo or something? No. You don't. I think I would go Muay Thai on the shark. I would do elbows yeah. and knees. I'm just a little crazy. If I could start bringing you all in, some of our lines are moving, which means we probably have shark friends oh. So the students began the arduous task of pulling up the weights and the lines from 150 feet beneath the boat. And with every line, anticipation of a beast on the other end. Intact. And after a handful of empty hooks, prayers answered. Uh, all right, we got one on the line. Yep. Oh my god. These sandbars, they're yep. snappy. They're oh. snappy. The first shark of the day was a female sandbar shark. They're common in this area and often seen in shallow sandy bottom waters, hence the name. The university interns, along with the captain of the boat, were charged with getting the shark secured on the swim platform. A task way easier said than done. She's a little feisty. Yeah, she's got spirit, this one. I like that. You can see that flexible cartilaginous skeleton in action. Yeah. It's not tired yet. We like to see this though. It means that they're still in good condition. Hold it, put weight on that. Once a shark is secure, oh. the first matter of business is to place a seawater pump into its mouth. This allows the shark to breathe while out of water. Hold on, hold on. Then the high school students, who were already given specific tasks to perform, get to try their hands at field work, usually reserved for those with years of experience. 46. Huh? 46. 46. They take measurements. 29 and a half. Test reflexes. Very nice. Collect tissue samples. Fin clip. Like fin clip. And tissue biopsies. Scoop it out, kind of like if you were scooping ice cream. They also attach a monitoring tag. You can see how tough their skin is. And because sharks have only a tiny fraction of the pain sensing nerve endings that humans have, good tag. This work causes no more than minor discomfort for the shark. <laughs> and within a period of five to ten minutes, all the tests are completed and the shark is carefully released back into the water. Yee! Today, we landed four sandbar sharks. And it was about to get even better. Wait, wait. On one of the lines, a great hammerhead. Okay, you guys, you know the drill on the hammerhead. Despite their imposing stature and menacing features, the hammerheads are actually very sensitive to stress. And because of this, the university does not do a workup on the sharks. Hi, so the interns simply release the hammerhead back into the ocean. Even so, he seemed a little disoriented. You saw that he was kind of slow to swim off as opposed yeah. to some of the sandbars that are like, I'm out of here, buddy. So Virginia dove in to see if she could lend a hand. So what Kurt asked me to do was go into the water and then grab his dorsal fin and put it straight. And then grab him and push him a little bit through the water so as to give him a little bit of impulse to go through the water. Noticing that I was amazed at Virginia's gallantry, the crew of the boat gave me the designated task of seeing the next shark off into its watery home. And despite thinking it unwise, I caved to their request. And when the shark swam off into the distant blue, I gained a new appreciation for these majestic animals. That was amazing. It's actually pretty tranquil under there, I have to admit. My day could not get any better. But for these students, it was about to become a dream come true. Because on one of these lines was a shark that had never been caught by this crew in their thousands of expeditions, and has only been seen in these waters a handful of times. A great white. I don't think I've ever seen them that excited. I mean, everybody raced over and we started leaning and then they were leaning out over it and I was like, okay kids, please, please just step back. Just when all the students managed to get a glimpse of the most powerful shark in the sea, it shredded through the 1,800 pounds of line and slipped off into the blue. But for these interns and students, it was enough to bring out the screaming child in everyone. Ah, 
This expedition was certainly something that these students will not soon forget. And it seems the program met its goal in building stewardship for this beautiful natural environment. This class has really taught me to like respect the keys more. I've realized how much of like an honor it is to live here. So we docked back in Isla Morada, and I took to the road heading south, where I planned to save the world with a trident and a morsel of squid. I think we've all learned a squid <laughs> today. My name is Dominic Bonicelli, and I am on a road trip through the Florida Keys, both searching for wild outdoor adventures. There are 20-foot pythons floating around out here. And working with local experts to help maintain this incredible natural environment. Yeah! Today, I find myself halfway down the island chain, where I plan to carry out an essential mission. In the middle of Marathon Key, there is a very special hospital. It looks a bit like a sanitarium from the 1920s, but it serves a unique client, one that's existed for millions of years, that lives to be more than 100 years old, but has more cards stacked against it than maybe any other sea creature. Everybody loves an underdog, right? Hello. Hey, Hi. are you ready? I'm ready. I'm Dominic. Nice, nice to, to meet you, Dom. You. Welcome to the Turtle Hospital. Thank you. The Turtle Hospital is a converted hotel that is now an ER and rehab center for one of nature's most vulnerable creatures. You can see Hillary there. Hillary had an intestinal blockage from eating plastic. They kind of eat anything, anything found floating or in the water. We have a prop injury over here. You can see a fracture on this head and also in the carabis or shell. And this is Elsa. Lisa. And Elsa has fiber papilloma tumors. The rise in occurrence of these tumors has been linked to the increase in sewage in ocean waters. Is this um, one missing a fin? Yep, she has a nub. Another major problem endangering turtles is entanglement with ropes and fishing line. In her case, she lost her flipper. Fortunately, that's not a death sentence for a sea turtle. That uh, flipper is going to get twice as strong now, so she'll take off just fine. As will her arm yeah. wrestling career, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna glove you up here. Okay. The law forbids unlicensed individuals from handling these endangered sea turtles. There, there. But I still wanted to help out in any way I could. I was this a roller skate waiter at a car hop a couple years, so this is a skill perfect. I have. There you go. Of the seven species of sea turtles found in the world, if you'll hand me down the line, five of them are found here in the Florida Keys. That was easy. And all of them are considered endangered. You can set Miss Daisy right here. So this is uh, an x-ray table. Look at you, you look great. She's not paying attention. A turtle will not look at its own x-ray. I read that. As soon as she gets a hold of that squid, you want to let go. I don't know if you know this, Dom, but they've been around on this planet for close to 200 million years. Make her swim. Just oh, make her swim? Oh, this is that. part of her exercise, too. Yeah. And they're still found today as they were found in prehistoric dinosaur times. Oops. Uh -oh, the... She lunged like oh, a no. panther. There's a learning curve for you. Let's see. 19.5? 19.5. Yep. After any necessary surgeries, medicines, or rehab, when the turtles are healthy enough to be released back into the wild, they get measured and tagged, and they even get a subcutaneous computer chip. Now, does she get a treat afterwards or something? Sometimes I do. I give a little squid head as a treat. A squid yeah. head. That does sound delicious. I think we've all learned a squid head today. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Fisher here is going to be released in a week or two. But today... Good. All right. Perfect. Nice job. It's Senor Fab who will be making the journey back home. Oh, She jumped when you closed the door. The Turtle Hospital founder, Richie Moretti, was here to make sure it all went off without a hitch. George, if you'll get behind me. <laughs> I think George could get most hey, of this like, by himself. Richie used to do releases from his boat, but he decided he could build more right, stewards of the face. oceans by announcing the releases and doing them at public beaches. Yay! We saw that his plan was going off without a hitch. If anybody that's getting in the water, make a V so she doesn't come at you. All right. Throngs of turtle fans had arrived to see Senor Fab off to his watery home. She's great last. Adios, Senor Fab. You will live to feast on squid another day, my friend. I said goodbye to Betty. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Ciao.
and headed south from Marathon over the Seven Mile Bridge, a veritable driver's paradise. On the left, the Atlantic Ocean extends all the way to Africa. On the right-hand side is Florida Bay, as far as I can see. And just one hour south of the Seven Mile Bridge lies the town at the southernmost point in the continental United States, Key West. This quaint and colorful town known for its tolerance attracts bohemians and ferals who choose to fall off the map. Of course, the Lower Keys are also home to a myriad of water sports like paddling, here are there be dragons, and snorkeling, and almost anything you can imagine. But right now, I am yearning for a blast of endorphins. Would you like to know my recipe for the perfect adrenaline cocktail? Wind, water, sun, surf, yes, a ration of rocket fuel, a dollop of danger. Prepare, my friends, to witness the birth of a superhero. Jetpack Adventures in Key West offers mere mortals the opportunity to careen through the air strapped to a water-powered jetpack. And I just had to see for myself if this sport is as insanely thrilling as it looks. So they took me out to a safe place to try my skills. As a superhero. We'll have a helmet on you so we can communicate with you. They outfitted me with gear and strapped me in the jetpack. Can I get a sheepskin seat cover though? That'd be a little more comfortable. And then gave me a quick lesson while still on the boat. Just bring it all the way up, bring this one down, and that's gonna square your shoulders again. It's pushing close to a thousand gallons a minute at full throttle, so. Well, I hope I don't suck up a manatee and shoot that out the back. Yeah, it'll shoot it right through. I could probably get to the moon if I did that though. I think so. <laughs> Take a step back and jump in. After my debriefing, I was into the arena where I began my career in crime fighting. Arms down all the way so your waist is in the water. There you go. And then just above the surface of the water. That's how you want to start, just like that. Like anything, it was a little challenging at first. We're not trying to get any height right now. We're just getting a feel for the pack. But I was a believer within seconds. I'm buying it. I'll buy it. How much is it? I want it. I'll sell my house, I have to have it. You're doing great, that's perfect. These insane devices allow flight by propelling massive amounts of water at high speed out of the back of the jets, pushing you in the opposite direction. This is achieved using a 250 horsepower pump inside a trailing pod. When you're ready, hold your breath and dip those handles about seven inches under the water. With Patrick's instruction, what was awakened in me was a dormant gene and I was no longer bound to the physics that tether mere mortals. <laughs> so now that I was wearing the heavy burden of responsibility to do good, I was ready for my next challenge, where I will go head to head with a venomous predator to save the oceans. My name is Dominic Bonicelli, and I am on a quest for adventure from Miami down to Key West. But I'm also finding exhilarating ways that locals and visitors are helping to preserve the natural beauty of this waterscape. Today, I have an appointment at Key West Harbor where I will be undertaking a mission that is essential for the survival of diversity on the reef. I have been summoned to join a crack naval team to fight one of the most pernicious fiends in the ocean. Hey, welcome. Jeremy, nice Jeremy, to meet you. Jeremy, how are you? Good, how are you? Brad, nice to meet you. Hey, Brad, how are you? Jeremy and Brad from Dive Key West are to be my comrades in arms against the venomous lionfish. So what are the tools of the trade here, my friend? Well, we found pretty much through trial and error that our best tool is this, a, a pole spear. The lionfish, they don't have any natural fear of humans, so they'll let you get right up close to them, and then, uh, and then we use this bad boy to, to, to spear them. Do you ever try to confuse them with a wetsuit that looks like a manatee, so you look even less threatening, and then they just surround you? No. The lionfish is an invasive species whose numbers have been growing rapidly in the Keys since first seen here in 2009. And because this species wreaks havoc on indigenous fish populations, locals have been doing all they can to thin their numbers. We want to keep all the nice little pretty fish on the reef, uh, so we'll, we'll do what we can to take them off. Plus, one added bonus to hunting the lionfish? They are tasty. They're very, very similar to snapper. Very mild and white and flaky. So looking forward to dinner back here at the marina, we headed out toward the reef, 
when Poseidon set the stage for our epic battle by conjuring an 18-knot wind and churning the seas. Am I gonna vomit all day long? There's a good possibility of that. There's a good possibility of that. Jeremy took us about five and a half miles off the shore to a reef ledge called Ball and Chain. And as the sea grew more anxious, we donned our battle gear. You can get right up to him, all right? OK. Pull this back as far as you can get it. OK. So as far as you can get it, so you get a back thrust. Get the point right up to his head. Oh. And then let it fly. So we set out on our undersea hunt in search of the perilous foe. This fish is designed to defend against its adversaries, and it's armed with spines that hold a toxin capable of delivering an immensely painful sting that in rare cases can even be fatal. The more you come in contact and the harder contact with this creature depends on the severity of the sting. We've heard everything from it's like wrapping your finger with dental floss and sticking it in hot coals to, uh, to you know, it's like, a, it's like a mosquito bite. Despite the dangers, divers are encouraged to spear the fish, and at certain times, or with a special license, the fish can even be taken in the protected areas. Outside of those areas, one does not even need a fishing license to take them in Florida waters. Evidence of the dangers that these fish pose to the balance of life in this fragile ecosystem, where the lionfish can eat up to seven times its weight per day and reproduce at an insane rate. Most fish spawn maybe once or twice a year. The lionfish can spawn two to three times a month, and they drop anywhere from 10 to 20,000 eggs every, every two weeks. The lionfishes have been spotted in depths up to 1,000 feet. Are we going to eradicate them? No. But we can try and control the population. It wasn't long before Brad and I had both speared a lionfish. But showing an abject lack of trust for his comrade or wisdom beyond his years, Brad consolidated them on his spear. And we proceeded to take a total of four lionfish from these waters before our air ran out for the day. We hauled our catch back to the boat and headed back to the marina, where Jeremy gave me some pointers on how to very carefully fillet these heavily armed fish. So what we want to do is make sure we go with the spines when we're cut. Of course, you try not to make contact, but in the event you do, at least you're going with them. This is not going to be like an ice sculpture. This is going to be a little bit ugly. Just like playing any other fish. <laughs> yeah, there you go, just like that. My masterpiece. Looks pretty good, huh? And then it magically is cleaned and prepped and ready to go. Are you Clive? I'm Clive. How are you? Hey, I'm Dominic. Clive, the resident chef at Key West Harbor, agreed to cook my fish so that I could see just how succulent lionfish can be. I'm going to make lion in the rough. So we dip them in flour, egg, and cornflakes. And we're going to uh, lightly uh, fry these lionfish. Three minutes on each side, and then served with... Hickey masala, avocado, and tomatoes with salt and pepper. And a special sauce. This is called a rundown. It's a coconut reduction with citrus and a hint of mackerel. And the final product gave me real hope that humans will never get bored of pulling lionfish out of these waters. Oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Clive, thank you so much, man. This is incredible. No problem. I hunted it down, I cooked it up, I savored it. Not a bad way to save the planet. As the sun sets over the Gulf of Mexico, reality finally sets in. My adventure has come to an end because the road ends here. But tomorrow, I begin the scenic drive home, and I challenge you to find the scenic pathways and hidden gems that connect to every driveway in America. And I say, don't start in the middle of the map. Choose a destination on the edges of the map, off the edges of the map, where there be dragons, because you never know what treasure you might find.